Okay, so um, uh, the problem with being last up is pretty much everything that I had to say. <laughs> it's already been said. <laughs> so, so this is not only going to be fairly low brow, but this sort of thing. the novelty value is going to be very low. Um, the, the advantages it sort of gives me the, the last word, as it were, it gives me a chance to kind of throw my, my own spin on the many things that have been brought up during the thing here. So, but I mean, for that reason in particular, I, I do want to sort of encourage use of uh, economist rules. I mean, since I, uh, that's what the, uh, uh, since at the LSE, we, interruption is the norm. Uh, the, the audience has been very well behaved during this conference, but you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to persist during this talk. It's fine. Um, so I, uh, broadly what I want to do is kind of um, explore a, a, a compromise view. I mean, it wasn't sort of intended as a compromise view, but I now see it as a, a view that in some sense I think does justice to uh, the points made by various different speakers in, in, in the audience. And sort of focusing around this kind of, or I hope that's, you know, wh where this will lead to is some answer to Tony's challenge about abdication of scientific responsibility, because I think that's a, a, a sort of really critical issue about the, the extent of scientific responsibility and where, at what point sort of stepping over that becomes a kind of irresponsibility. And I think sort of people have rather different views, implicit views about where that line is exactly. It's sort of at what point silence is more responsible than, than uh, opinion, offering opinion and so on. So, so that, that's the kind of going to be the organizing theme in, in retrospect, as it were. I should say up front, I mean, just because this is now becoming part of the dialogue here, I, I was a teenage subjective Bayesian. Um, and uh, uh, in, in, some way, in many ways, actually, I still think it's, it provides the standard of rationality, you know, under certain conditions. Uh, and the world would be a better place if there was more Bayesian stuff going on. I still think that that's lots of areas where, which would just function better if people thought that way. Um, but, you know, as Bergeon might have said, but didn't, uh, you know, if you aren't a Bayesian by the time you're 30, you have no ambition. But if you're still a Bayesian by the time you're 50, you have no modesty. I mean, that's the... <laughs> That's the way, the way I see it. <laughs> okay, so the, the sort of ostensible focus of this is about the relationship between science and policy making. And I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the joining points between these two things. And in particular with a focus on sort of how the, the issue of model uncertainty is, should be handled at that join. Um, so this is the, the issue about what, what sort of the line of responsibility is exactly and what we can do as policy makers or as scientists to sort of manage that line. So I'm going, to, I'm going to look at sort of three proposals that have all been made in effect over the last few days for ways uh, to, to manage that line, focusing in particular on some sort of uh, proposals for model averaging. I will look at Bayesian model averaging in particular here. It's not the only variety that's around. Some of the sort of robustness, some versions of the robustness thing, and then, uh, you know, to this confidence type reasoning, which is the one that I favor. So the sort of less reconcili the sort of reconciliation here is supposed to be to sort of motivate this idea of confidence as a way of getting a very precise handle on where that line should be drawn. So that's a sort of rhetorical strategy here. And uh, uh, I hope I get far enough to make the, the argument at least. So uh, uh, the sort of very toy model of this process that we want to start with, it's inadequate, it was always in many ways, but I think it will help fix what I think is the importance, is this, this uh, uh, relationship between uh, the, the way of thinking about the, the role that models play in policy making. Um, so sort of, you know, in this toy model, you sort of think, well, first you do the science, and what the, the, the science is initially about sort of modeling the phenomenon that you're interested in. You sort of take, you get hold of the best scientific theories that you have, the data you have at hand. You make some assumptions to deal with the cases that you're interested in modeling and you spit something out. Now, the model output is very rarely just then used in policy making in raw form. It has, this has to be some sort of uh, forecasting process in which model outputs are combined with other things, typically human judgments of various kinds, uh, either sort of done in a formal way through expert elicitation or just in some kind of informal version. And then these forecasts feed into the policy evaluation and on the NICE model, the policy makers get sufficiently informative forecasts they know what goals they're pursuing. They combine the two and they pick the policy that maximizes benefit somehow relative to those two pieces of information. So that's the nice, that's the, the sort of uh, nice toy picture in which everything is working very well. And uh, uh, you know the theme of this will be this. Uh, I mean, my the sort of slogan is this: words of wisdom from Charles that 
And you know, if you want to do this up here, uh, credibly, it, you've got to sort of recognize the uncertainties that are floating around in, in this process. Okay, so that's the uncertainties here that are, we're worried about. So uh, I will at some point look at much more specific versions of things because real versions of the way this thing works are much, much messier. And some of the mess is actually quite important to understanding some of the subtleties, but this is the background picture. So uh, just some sort of preparatory stuff. I'm just going to, because people think about models in very different ways. Uh, uh, but the only thing that really matters here is being very careful about the difference between the model and the output of the model. In a, a lot of the sort of the decision theory slash economic literature, the two just get collapsed and people start to talk about models as if they just were a probability distribution. But um, the way I'm thinking about models is a sort of more structured entity, something that sort of canonically consists of a specification of a set of causal or functional relationships, some, some equations, if you like. And then there'll be uh, you know, some parameter values, some specification of initial conditions, boundary conditions, and so on. So they're, they're, they're structured objects. They're not just sort of flat probability distributions. And uh, that's important. Important both in the sort of positive sense because it's the structure that gives understanding ultimately. It's typically what enables you to get some sort of causal understanding of what it is that's behind the data that you're observing. But it's also what makes some of the sort of attempts to deal with the uncertainty quite tricky, I think. And this is stuff that came up in Dave's talk quite prominently. I think, uh, I think it's useful to distinguish between, I mean, models are used for all sorts of different things, but. So one very fundamental difference that it's important to distinguish here is between models that are broadly just about prediction. These sort of like the climate models initially you're just wanting to get out some forecast about some uh, variable. And policy m models where you're, um, you're thinking about an intervention on a system, um, an intervention that potentially has never been made before. So that uh, you, you're not just dealing with a fixed set of causal relationships. You're dealing with something that possibly breaks those causal relationships apart. One that in, uh, so, the, 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 I mean, the distinction is much less clear in principle, but I think the, the fact that the presence of the intervention in the model <coughs> makes a big difference to the, way, the sort of uncertainty that gets generated. So, uh, uh, models typically provide, you know, policy models, but so, or the, you know, the pairing of these models then provide us not just knowledge with sort of evolution of the sort of key facts that we're interested in, you know, how surface sea surface temperatures are evolving or, you know, sort of uh, what seismic activity there is and so on, but also about uh, the effects of these policy interventions on the target variables, the stuff that we're interested in, sort of the welfare stuff, if you like, ultimately. Uh, and these are sort of the counterfacts. I mean, this is the, it's providing us knowledge about what would happen were we to do certain kinds of things. Um, and, and so if you, if you, particularly with these policy models, if you want to get uh, sort of sensible answers out of the model, uh, you really need to identify the causal structure properly. And this is terribly hard. I mean, this is, you all know this. It's terribly hard because essentially this is about um, non-observable stuff. I mean, to estimate the effects of novel policy interventions means relying on counterfactual claims of one sort. And you, there is, you can use data to support counterfactual claims, but you can't make direct observations, obviously, of counterfactual. So, you know, that's... So I think in a deep way, what makes this kind of policy, this policy modeling very, very difficult. Um, now, why am I not? Let's see if it, yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, a, a little bit about what, what sort of uncertainties we're typically having to deal with. Um, I'm breaking up into sort of four things here. People are broken up in all sorts of different ways. Um, and first is this, the sort of basic physical uncertainty. Uh, I, can, I sort of think of this as objective uncertainty. This is the stuff that uh, is built into the models themselves. There's some sense part of nature, even even if you sort of think nature is ultimately deterministic at the level of the specification of the novel uh, of the model, can be thought of as sort of irreducible, aleatory uncertainty. Uh, then there's stuff that's quite clearly epistemic. Um, this is your sort of handle on the initial conditions for the model, uh, uh, being able to make precise measurements is often very difficult and so on. I have limited data for that kind of thing. Um, unmodeled factors. So, I mean, anybody who builds these models knows you may have to make some choices about what to put in the model and what to leave out. And there's sort of two kinds of things here. There's the stuff you know you're not modeling. Um, so, you know, if you're doing a model of inflation, probably you leave, you know, a certain amount of political stuff out, 
because it's not your domain. You know that if there's a revolution, it's going to affect inflation, but it's not in the model because you know, it's, it's not in the model. You can't put everything in the model. Um, and then there's the sort of worry about the unknown unknowns, you know, in the uh, famous phrase. Uh, uh, where you sort of suspect there's stuff that's not in the model, but you, you haven't got the imagination quite to sort of, you, you're not, you don't trust your own imagination to have come up with everything that's there. So that's the sort of unmodel factors. And then there's just this uncertainty about the core of the model, these causal or structural relationships between the variables that you're employing. Um, and, and when I talk about model uncertainty, I'm sort of thinking about the two, three and four together. Other people have used the word just to sort of describe four. I think both of those, I, I want to group them together because both of those give rise to the same psychological phenomenon, if you, if you like, the sort of unease that you feel as a modeler about the outputs that are coming from the thing. Okay. So now, just to sort of nail some of the things down with some examples. Just this happens, it happens to be stuff that I'm work, working on at the moment and because it's the only applied work I've ever done, I'm sort of you know, awfully proud of it, so I have to talk about it. Um, it's, for philosophers to do applied work is just so, so hard. So, you know, it's, uh, um, so I've been looking at two kinds of cases and they're both na cases of using natural hazard modeling, catastrophe modeling if you like, to inform uh, policy decision making of very different kinds. Uh, and they're very different cases. So one case is looking at modeling of hurricanes in the, the Atlantic, particularly landfalling on the, the Florida coast. Uh, this, this is this, you know, big industry modeling going on here because the insurers have a lot at stake here. And so there are these kind of very, very fine-tuned decisions that have to be made by people who are putting a lot of money or have a lot of money at stake on this activity. Um, and the other case that I'm looking at is uh, uh, tsunami inundation on the western coast of India, sort of in a way completely the opposite case. There's almost no money involved in the modeling there, so we're right at the opposite end of the spectrum. On the other hand, there are a lot of kind of, if you like, very coarse-grained decisions that need to be made here. D don't really depend terribly on the sophistication of the modeling, like just sort of what level of evacuation and emergency procedures do you need to invest in. You really don't need to know very precisely anything about the, the, the level of, and, and velocity of the, the waves that are going to hit. You just sort of need some basic understanding of, uh, you know, what, you know, look, is this a one in a thousand year event or is it just a one in 50? I mean, I need to, that's the sort of level at which you need some specification. Um, so although uh, uh, it, it, you, you end up sort of in a, in a situation that's very similar because of the, in both cases, the match between the level of information that you need to make the policy making and what you're getting out of them and what you're getting out of the out of the models themselves uh, is sort of a, is is giving rise to some ease. There's not enough coming out of the models to make the policy decisions, but for very different reasons in the two cases, in the in the hurricane case, because you need to make very very fine-grained decisions. So even though the modeling is very sophisticated, it's there's still a gap. In the other case, they're both coarse grained, but there's still a gap. So, um, so in, in these natural, in these catastrophe modeling things, models appear in, in various different places and with different roles. And here, the sort of distinction between the predictive and policy models is quite important. So, so most of the kind of discussion about model uncertainty occurs at this level, at the, the sort of hazard prediction thing. Most of the agonizing in the scientific literature is about this stuff. So, in particular, so uh, you know, and here we sort of uncertainties that I talked about before are very prominent in these cases. I mean, to take the tsunami inundation case, uh, you, there's almost no data that you can get because what drives tsunami inundation on the western coast is earthquakes. These are almost entirely in, you're looking at the Makran subduction zone, which happens to be off the coast of Pakistan and Iran. So basically, you can't get scientists in there because between the Pakistanians and the Iranians, they just won't let anybody in there. So it's almost impossible to get reliable information about initial conditions. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that earthquake science is in a state of crisis post Fukushima. Uh, people used to work with this idea that really sort of fundamentally the way this worked is that you had a subduction zone that had certain characteristics and those characteristics determined the upper bound of the earthquake that you were gonna get. And so the way this thing worked is pressure builds up, pressure builds up until you hit the, the limit for that subduction zone, all the energy is released, and then you go back to the thing again. This is modeled as a sort of Poisson process. You know, it, it turns out that the, the sort of probabilistic hazard mapping that was done on the on the basis of this 
has borne almost no relation to the way in which earthquakes have been occurring, even in you know, areas where it was fitted with a reasonable amount of data. I mean, in all of these areas, the, the number of data points is tiny. Right? I mean, that's the, really the, what makes these catastrophe models in, you know, particularly suitable for this discussion is that you're interested in the, the very rare events. You're interested in the magnitude 8.5 and up. You're interested in the category five storms because that's the ones that do the real damage. But for those, you have data points, you know, often, you know, <laughs> single figure data points. So hurricanes, I think the, the hurricane data, the HERDA database has 38 points in it or something like that for category storms three to five. Um, uh, uh, for the earthquakes in the Western Makran, it's, you know, for, th th there's, there's one that's kind of sort of, it, it's certain that it happened and there's lots of evidence about it. Then there's so archaeological evidence which suggests various predecessors from that. But that, you know, so it's tiny databases for these things. That being said, I don't even think that that's where most of the, <laughs> some of the, the, the and massive uncertainty that you get out is actually washed out by downstream uncertainties. So to get a proper risk assessment, of course, you don't need, you're just not doing just hazard prediction. You also have to have some specification of the vulnerability of the system that you're dealing with. Uh, here it's very mapped in great detail by the insurers in the sort of Florida area, but, you know, correspondingly, in India, what you have is pretty good uh, poverty maps and so on, but very little understanding of the way in, of the sort of vulnerabilities that depend on how humans will react to events. You just don't have much, <laughs> just don't have any data about this, right? So, um, uh, so these two things f f f feed together into a risk assessment, and, and here, you know, uh, decision theorists are often guilty of sort of treating they start, when they start with the risk assessment up here, they, they essentially take the, the, states, the state space here is, is sort of given by your hazard events, and then they say, well, you know, we just map a consequence to each state, and this mapping is supposedly, I mean, this is in effect a, an assumption of a certain kind of vulnerability model. Um, and this part is, you know, in the savage tradition, for those who sort of work in this thing, uh, is always treated as a sort of part of the work where there's no uncertainty. We just sort of assume we know what that mapping is. But in practice, getting that mapping from the events, the hazard events over which you're getting predictions to a specification in the output is massively uncertain. And, uh, uh, and it's, you know, sort of, it's, 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 lots of damage can be done by forgetting about that. I think. All right, and so the, the final sort of part of this system is so the risk assessment needs to be turned into some kind of welfare evaluation perhaps even more broadly, some kind of ethical evaluation, which then serves as the basis for the decision making. It's at this point that the decision makers, the decision and the stakeholders' values and goals and so on get fed into the process. Uh, you make some evaluation, you do a policy, and then policy models uh, are supposed to tell you something about what the effect of this policy is. So in this deliberation is some thoughts about how oh, this part of the circle, where you think about various policy interventions, how that affects the exposure state of the, the system that you're interested in, how that affects vulnerability. Uh, and, and here, I, th I think we know almost nothing. I mean, so th this part, the uncertainty here washes out the uncertainty up here. This, but almost all the agonization is up here rather than down here. So um, I sort of want to focus more, or more on these sort of policy issues because the fact that we don't know the effects of interventions is very important in the system. Okay, so this is the kind of example that I'll have in mind when we discuss it. So, so uh, of those sort of four kinds of uncertainties as I mentioned, even though they're very severe in these cases, I think we have very good techniques for handling them. I mean, broadly, uh, both physical uncertainty and these sort of uncertainty about initial conditions, although they're very different in kind, they can be managed in the same kind of way. And broadly, the, I think the right way to ma manage this is by constructing models which give interval predictions or even probability distributions over potential values. And uh, since Chuck mentioned this yesterday, a good example of this is this fan chart that the Bank of England produces. This is the famous rivers of blood representation of the inflation rate. Uh, where it's not quite a probability distribution, but it's sort of suggestive of a distribution where the, the darkness of the shading suggests that the, the forecasters here, this is not just the models, it's a bunch of models here which are doing different things, and it's fed through a committee 
which sort of combines this evidence, comes up with an educated judgment about this in the way that I think you have to do in these cases, and gives you something like this, this interval with some implicit weights on it. So we're, we're, we're on the way to a probability distribution. Um, so the, it's, the office of, no, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the Office of Budget Responsibility has a similar kind of thing for, for other variables uh, known, uh, known as the shades of gray uh, diagram. Uh, and although that, you might think that's suggestive of fiscal discipline, apparently the real reason is that the Treasury, unlike the Bank of England, just can't afford color printers, so they have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so that's, that's, uh, th that I think is, is the sensible way of handling some of the uncertainty, but this just doesn't exhaust all the uncertainty that's around. In particular, it doesn't exhaust, it doesn't handle <laughs> what I've been calling the model uncertainty, these worry about unmodeled factors and about the, the structural equations and so on. So that's, so it's the model uncertainty that I want to talk about now. So what I mean by this, well, why do we get model uncertainty? Well, we've had a lot of discussion about this already. I mean, it arises, I mean, most obviously in these catastrophe model cases because the empirical evidence is simply too sparse to fix the causal functional relationships that you're interested in or the corresponding parameter relations, parameter values. And I, I, I mean, I don't need to say too much about this because I think Dave already walked us through some sort of compelling reasons to think why that's true of the climate models. And actually, these models that you're looking at are super sophisticated in comparison to some of the catastrophe modeling. So that's the sort of already the high end of this stuff, right? Um, so, and what this, this is sort of concretely manifested in the fact that there, were, there are often just sort of multiple models around in the literature, and never mind the ones that one could sort of dream up if you were wanting to be sort of clever about this, that are completely consistent with the data. And that's not surprising because uh, when these models are making probabilistic estimations, uh, there's nothing like a decisive refutation of a probabilistic distribution, because after all, you could just be unlucky, your model, the, the dice is fair, but you just get 10 sixes in a row, and then you start to wonder, whether, you know, you can just be unlucky with these things. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, the sort of answer that, so it would be nice in this sort of situation to just have some reason to pick one model from these things, perhaps the best fitting model. But even if there is a best fitting model, it's often reasonable for modelers to have doubts about the predictions yielded by the best fitting model. I mean, the fact that it's best doesn't mean that it's, that it's good in any sort of absolute sense, um, because they know that that model idealizes in various ways that it's fitted to very sparse data and so on. So uh, you know, being awarded the prize for being best fitting is not, doesn't change the situation enormously. Um, and in any case, I mean, even you know, in any case, even if there is a best-fitting model under these circumstances, it doesn't seem unreasonable to still take a look at the models that are performing tolerably well against the data that you've got, um, be because they're based on different assumptions, and uh, you don't really have a handle on which of these assumptions are most reasonable. So, th so there's, you know, just from sort of modeling practice, you know, I think in effect, many modelers find themselves in a situation where. Uh, you know, on the one hand, they feel they have their favorite model, they have grounds for favoring that model, they can give you arguments for it, but at the same time, they recognize that there are reasons for looking at other models as well. So let's just look at three ways in which this, the model uncertainty of this kind can be managed. So one very, very common idea is just to average them. Um, this is, in fact, what's done with hurricane models, uh, the, the sort of data that's supplied to insurers uh, comes from you know, 13 or 14 different models, which, uh, I mean, calling them different models, well, this is a big problem, I'll point to them. Uh, they're sort of typically sort of variants on one or two models. So you've sort of got model classes with different variants. But, you know, in the end, what you have is sort of 13, 14 kind of models that, that people work with, and they average over this. And so the general idea is you, you've got this class of models, you want to score them somehow in terms of how well they, they perform, both you know, against the data, but possibly also in terms of sort of simplicity and explanatory power, any other sort of criterion that you think is relevant to assessing the model. And then you just weight the model's predictions by the score that you have, and construct some kind of average probability. And then you do sort of standard maximization of expected utility as the policymaker on the basis of that average prediction. Um, the most sort of commonly used version of this is, is Bayesian model averaging, and all of this is made much clearer within this framework. When you do Bayesian model averaging, essentially you treat the models as, as if they were a certain kind of factual claim 
sort of lumped together. So you treat model uncertainty as a sort of factual uncertainty, an uncertainty about what in fact are the true relationships out there in nature. And then you just construct some sort of state space uh, in which every possible model in principle is in this state space. And you put a probability distribution on that and you take the probabilistic average. Uh, you can do some sort of fancy things when you come to the decision theory side of this. Uh, you can sort of break down this averaging and allow for ambiguity aversion by distorting uh, the averaging process in such a way as to account for caution. So there's lots of kind of clever variations on this thing, but the general strategy is, 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 all, is always the same. Isn't it? And the problem's are always the same, I think. Um, uh, I don't have any problem, conceptual problem with was averaging the probability estimates that the, this is where this difference between the estimates and the models themselves matter. I mean, averaging the probability estimates produced by these models is a perfectly coherent exercise. There's no problem with that. The trouble is that we have no idea how to score these things, and that's why we want to, people want to look at the models rather than the outputs, because they feel that they have some handle on how to score models. But if we sort of literally think about the scoring of the models in the Bayesian way, I think it quickly sort of shows itself to be problematic again. I mean, I think sort of Dave has been over a lot of this territory. I, I mean, if, if you want to do probabilistic averaging properly, you really have to have the full state space there. But if you sort of think about what that state space is, I, Dave's word was loony, and I, I think that's sort of <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just, a, it's a very, very big state space. In practice, what people are doing is they're, they're working with the 13 or 14 models that are in the literature and that people take seriously, this, and they average those. But we're nowhere near the kind of uh, space that you require in order to do coherent <coughs> Bayesian averaging, because these models are not independent in any kind of way. I mean, they have, I mean, they have vertical and horizontal relationships between them, which ought to be reflected <coughs> in the distribution, so the weights can't be independent and so on. But for sort of simplicity reasons, you make them independent. So it's a mess. I mean, basically, in practice, this model of averaging is a mess. And, and I think many, very often, it's, it's, because it's so messy in practice, shouldn't be done. Um, it shouldn't be done at this level. Uh, sort of moving, sort of, sort of, you know, down. I, none of these, none of these points, I think, are sort of knocked down on their on their own. I just sort of want to suggest that the sort of sum total of these worries about Bayesian model averaging are enough to make us think that this can't be the solution in all cases. I mean, second problem, and this has also been mentioned before. I mean, there's a sense in which everybody knows all models are false, <laughs> right? They all incorporate idealizing assumptions of some kind. So sort of this metaphor of thinking of the probabilities that you're attaching to them as, as probabilities of truth, uh, it can't be right. Um, because they're not, in many ways, these, these models are not aiming to be tr sort of exactly true. They're aiming at some kind of approximation of things. Um, and because they're encoding very different kinds of assumptions, it's not clear what's happening when you average. Because some of these, you know, in a sort of deep sense, how, how can these assumptions be averaged in a big form? At least, uh, you ought to be a bit suspicious about what's going on there, unless you have a clear understanding of what the relationship is between the assumptions in the background of these models. And that's not often examined. I mean, for me, the most fundamental objection, though, is that you know, what makes a model good, good or bad depends on what you're using it for. Um, so you can sort of score a model sort of relative to a very particular purpose. So if you, if you just want to get probability of rainfall, then you can look at your model and say, is this good for rain? Is this not? But uh, 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 the idea of sort of giving models some sort of uh, purpose-independent weight so that somehow just has to do with their fit with data and with their simplicity and explanatory power, I think, is, is badly wrong. Um, we really should think about models in terms of the purposes that you want to put, at, put them to. And if it's, for instance, predictive purposes, that means we should really look at the kinds of probabilistic estimates or probabilistic judgments that they support. So really, the, uh, uh, I think by looking, trying to weight the models themselves, we're not capturing adequately the role that models play in, this, in the forecasting business. The role that they should play, or I think the better way to think about the role that they're playing, is to think of them as giving support to certain kinds of probabilistic estimates. And then, you know, once one can sort, sort out, because different models can support the same estimate, of course, and so they, you really want to sort of think about all the kinds of reasons you have for adopting a particular estimate, and then if you have more than one estimate that you have good reason to adopt, you might want to think about averaging at that level. But averaging at the level of the models themselves seems to me to be a, a fraught with lots of difficulties. 15 minutes, okay. I'm going much too slowly. Um, 
Second kind of uh, idea here, and we've, again, we've sort of seen a lot of this, sort of is just uh, in the light of these difficulties to sort of move to some kind of thought about robustness. And uh, uh, here the idea is you just think about it, some sort of class of models generated by modification of what we call them the contestable model elements. They don't have to be contestable in any deep sense. And then you just look at the intervals of values or probabilities that the class induces and take that as your decision input. And uh, then you sort of help yourself to some kind of act decision rule which allows you to use the, the whole class and which gives you a choice that, that is sensitive to considerations of robustness across the whole interval of values. There's more than one possibility here. So just to fix our thoughts, there's a version that's very popular in the economics literature due to Hansen and Sargent, uh, where they start with a, a reference model. Now here they use the word model to mean a probability distribution, which is where some of this confusion comes in, not the, the sort of thick model in the background. And then they generate a family of probability distributions around the, the reference one using, I mean, using a distance measure, actually, they use the kullback leibler so sort of an entropy-based uh, measure, doesn't really matter, uh, uh, away from the reference model. And somehow this, the size of this entropy ball away from the reference model is supposed to capture the degree of model uncertainty that you have. And so that's the idea. And then you, uh, what they recommend is you maximize minimum expected utility relative to that, that ball. So that's a, one version of this thing. So you know, people argue a lot of the sort of focus has been on whether maximum expected utility is a sensible rule to use in these court because it leads to very cautious decision making. But and there are of course many other rules that one can use for these things. So that's not really the main point here. Uh, the main point here, I think, is that this sort of technique raises a very important question: the question of how we choose the set of model models that we're going to take as the basis for applying whatever decision rule that we are, the size of the entry people at all. And, so not, and it's not just about answering that question, but sort of thinking about who's supposed to answer that question. Um, so is the choice of that class of, ref, class of models that we're going to take into consideration, is that a scientific question? So is there some sort of measure that we can get of model uncertainty that's going to give us the answer to that? So more model uncertainty, the larger the class we're supposed to look at or something. Or is this a question that's to be settled by the policymaker on the basis of some sort of attitude they have to uncertainty, you know, some sort of uncertainty aversion of some kind. Um, and it's not clear in these models with these things. So the, 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 the answer that I want to suggest, I mean, it's surprising, it's the answer that, in, a, in effect, Brian has already given. I think the, thought, well, the sensible thing here is to, to answer this by saying, well, what we need to do is look at the set of models that's sufficient to give us the confidence we need in order to make the decision that we need to make, and that will depend on what the decision is. So there's a, you need to calibrate uh, the sort of ro level of robustness that you require to something about the decision problem that you have to hand. So, so, and what will do the calibration here is some notion of confidence. So I just want to spend a little, bit, a few minutes just talking about uh, confidence uh, and what I think confidence is, because we've used this word a lot, but in a sort of informal way. Um, and uh, uh, so broadly, I think of confidence as a second order attitude, a judgment of a certain kind that is made by both scientists and policymakers um, uh, that takes as its objects first order judgments, and in particular, first order probability judgments of some kind. So it's a grading of first order judgments. That doesn't have to be probability judgments, but in this case, the interesting ones are where these judgments are probabilistic in form. Okay, so that's pretty much sort of all that we need. So the, what, what, what's important about these judgments is that they, you know, not only uh, can be calibrate, they not only help us calibrate our decision making, but they also t take, tell us how to learn from the evidence in an important way. So I want to spend a little bit of time showing how it affects the way we learn from evidence and then go back to essentially Brian's story about the decision making, hopefully in the time that I've got left. Okay, so, uh, 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 so let's, uh, I was going to make some points about different forms of uncertainty, but let's just start with these, these sort of first two situations, which has come up again and again. This distinction between situations of risk and ambiguity. <coughs> so the risk case is a standard case. We have an urn full of balls, which you know to be half black, half white. So that's, and the ambiguity case, so other Ellsberg, Ellsberg's very, you have a ball cont uh, urn containing black and white balls, but unknown proportion. And I just point out that both of these problems are in a sense are relative. This is, the uncertainty contained here is much less than the third possibility where all you know is that there, there's a ball, there are balls in this urn. 
maybe. Right? No, yeah, or even maybe, if you like. Right. Uh, but let's just, let, you know, let's make it not too hard. There are balls of, of color <laughs> in this urn, and you're asked for the probability of a black draw. So I, I sort of think that, you know, the move from B to C is as important as the move from A, a to B uh, in thinking about how uncertain things can get. But let's just focus on urn B. Um, so, uh, and now, you know, in the sort of standard setup, sort of imagine we're offered bets on the draw of a black ball from uh, any one of these urns. Let's focus on B, for instance, uh, and uh, a white or a black ball, either way, symmetrically. And the question is, what odds would you accept uh, for these bets, and how many of these bets would you take? This is the sort of the, the scenario for the decision maker. Uh, and it seems pretty obvious in, in, case urn, in case of urn A that, you know, the odds should be even. Um, not so clear what people say different things about the other urns, right? Uh, but that's, uh, but the, uh, the second question is sort of less frequently addressed. So let's just look at it diagrammatically what's going to happen. So, uh, your, so your, your objects of choice here are sort of packages of bets, right? Each of which paying this $1. And let's just suppose for simplicity that your utility in money is perfectly linear, so we can just think of this as utility space. So now we can, we have a very sort of simple uh, graphical representation of, of uh, your situation here. Uh, on the horizontal axis, it's what you, sort of your payoff in utilities are going to be for a package of bets in the event of a black ball being drawn. Right? And on the horizontal, it's for draw of a white ball. And any point in here represents a package of bets, and you just uh, 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 and what we're, we're trying, what we <coughs> these bets get more and more desirable as you go northeast, right? So uh, up here you've got bets that are paying out, irrespective, and paying out both for black and white bulls. So these are bets you should definitely take, right? Uh, but the interesting ones are in the the quadrants here because these are the ones up here. These are the ones that uh, the point is not working up here. Ah, oh. still? No, oh, yeah, thank you. Up here, you've got the ones that are paying out if black is drawn, and the ones down here are paying out if, if, if white's drawn. Okay. So if you're a kind of standard Bayesian, and you're thinking about the bets on the urns that we saw before, basically, you can draw a line at 45 degrees like this, which divides the desirable from undesirable packages of bets. And this line must be straight, because uh, you, use, you should be using your degrees of belief to value these bets. And since you have probability one half, because there, uh, there's nothing to distinguish the white and black balls, uh, you should be always, you should take anything to the right of this line. Yeah. And the, the sort of, the, the upshot of this, the ambiguity literature is that we have good reason, I mean, there's both empirical evidence that people don't have a straight line like this when you look at the, their actual behavior, but also that we have good reason for not behaving in accordance with that, but rather it should look something like this, where there's a spread, there's a difference between, as it were, our buying and asking price for these bets, uh, and that will be reflected, that, and, and the, the divergence here between the 45 degree line and the red line here, which is the, the line that represents the, 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 the betting evaluations of an, of, a, of an agent that recognizes ambiguity, this difference here will will give you a measure of the spread of their beliefs. Right. Um, so, so that's sort of the, the basic ambiguity paradigm is that we can, look, we can determine what the difference is between someone's lower and upper probabilities by looking at the differences between the odds that they'll accept on the black ball, for the purchase of a bet on the black ball from what they will be willing to sell it at. Okay. And that just seems very reasonable because if you're not too sure what the probability is, Caution dictates that you won't set a price at exactly on this line, but you'll want some sort of premium to reflect your ambiguity. So when we start to think about the issue of how, whether, so he, uh, maybe I just put the picture. Here's another person. This is a person who's different from the standard ambiguity averse uh, decision maker, because what's happening here is that apparently the degrees, the spread of degrees or the interval of degrees of belief that they're revealing in their betting behavior changes depending on the number of bets that they have accepted, right? I know another way of putting it is that they're sensitive to the exposure question here. This is a person who might be willing to buy, let me put it the other way around. If you're, if you're, either, if you're either a green guy or a red guy, 
There should be no limit to the number of bets. Once you've classed a certain type of bet as acceptable or desirable, there should be no limit to the number of these that you're prepared to buy up until your budget. Right? So when you, you just spend all your money on these things because they're good. Um, this blue guy is somebody who's, who, who's, who will give you an answer to the question, how many of these would I be willing to accept, which will be less than their budget line. So at some point, you'll have to make the odds more favorable in order for them to get to buy more. Okay, uh, so the, uh, what I want to now argue is that, the, I mean, so firstly, I hope that there's some intuition to the idea that you should worry about your level of exposure or that it's reasonable to worry about your level of exposure. And if you accept that intuition, then you're accepting the motivation to move beyond merely just an interval probability representation of your state of mind to incorporating some other factor, something that explains your sensitivity to exposure, right, which I'm going to call confidence, right? And let me give you a slightly sort of more principled argument for it, which will take us to the explanation of learning. So uh, let's now sort of add some learning to our scenario. So we're, again, we're working with the ambiguous urn. Let's focus on that. And suppose we're allowed to sample this urn. We're allowed to sample it lots, right? So sample it enough so that we're sort of moving from ambiguity to risk intuitively. Uh, and we can ask, what changes as we, as we do this? So this was a question that Popper, the paradox of ideal evidence, this is something that, of, that Popper, and Popper used this argument as uh, he was trying to attack precise Bayesianism because he said, you know, if you're a Bayesian, you think initially, well, you have no reason to distinguish white and black, so it's got to be 50-50, and now you get all this evidence, you know, doing all this learning and learning and learning, and the upshot of all of this is nothing. Right? At the end of it, it's still 50-50. So somehow probability is not representing something that's important that's going on. Uh, and this is actually a point that was made before Papa, uh, but in a, you know, with a completely different slant by Keynes, who sort of said, this is the quote, as, as the relevant evidence at our disposal increases, the magnitude of the probability of the argument may either in decrease or increase. In Popper's case, it doesn't change at all. But something seems to have increased in either case. We have a more substantial basis on which to rest our conclusion. I express this by saying that an accession of new evidence increases the weight of an argument. Okay. So what this Popper's argument draws our attention to, or Keynes actually in a more sophisticated way, is that evidence is relevant not just to the balance between sort of for and against some kind of proposition, but also the weight of the sort of the weight of the, there's also something about the weight of the evidence that we have for our judgment that changes our attitude to it. So Popper's argument is largely, I mean, Bayesians I think have largely successfully dismissed Popper's original challenge because there are ways within the Bayesian framework to do justice to this. You can look, for instance, at second order probabilities or you can look at the, uh, the resilience of the conditional probabilities in the face of new evidence. So it's not that version that's very interesting here. The interesting version, I think, is for when you think that you're an imprecise Bayesian or you think that you have interval probabilities because they, exactly the same problem arises. You start with some interval and uh, 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 you get all this, you know, all this evidence comes in, and at the end of it, what's the effect? Well, it's sort of, I mean, there are, there are some fairly principled arguments to suggest that if you do anything that looks like point-by-point -point conditionalization, nothing happens. Right? Uh, so it's sort of, it's not clear, it, it seems like the imprecise probability framework doesn't have any explanation for explaining or doing justice to our intuition that somehow our level of precision should increase as this evidence comes in. I mean, what should happen? What should happen is you should, whatever your initial interval of probabilities is, it should be narrow after all of, after all of the sampling, in the normal case. There are dilation cases too, but they're not, I'm not going to look at them now. Um, so, so that's the sort of puzzle, I think. The paradox for the imprecise basin is a little more. So uh, broadly speaking, this is what's going on. Uh, when you initially, you might... So this is how the sort of confidence framework, or the exposure framework, if you like, explains what's going on. I mean, the, the idea is that sort of initially you have, you may or may not have some views about where, what the probability, what the best probability judgments are. But these will be graded by your confidence in the probability judgments. When you've done no drawing from the thing, you know, you don't really have any confidence in any judgment other than that the probability is somewhere between zero and one. But, you know, with sort of low, very low confidence, you might think, well, you know, I mean, it sort of may well be between the, the quarter and three quarters or something like that. But anyway, I mean, most of the, there's going to be very little confidence on anything very precise. But what happens is the evidence comes in is these confidence into what, sh what shrinks is not, so I mean, the point here is it's not that your, uh, your imprecise intervals change it or anything like that. It's that the borders, once you fix a level of confidence, the 
interval of probability that meets that level of confidence changes with the sampling. So you can see that once, say, you've got 100 draws in, whereas previously, if you were looking for high confidence, you really had to go very close to the extremes. Now, if you want high confidence, you can get it by putting your interval between one quarter and three quarters. So it's, it's not simple, but other stuff has gone on as well. So it's not just that sort of one interval has changed, it's that the, interv the, the intervals meeting certain thresholds are changing across the board. So as the weight of evidence changes. So the, the, the sort of weight of evidence idea, so the, the, the sort is here is that the weight of evidence is supporting your confidence judgments and that's explaining what's going on. Okay, no, I'm horribly out of time. Upshot uncertainty is uh, captured not by a set of probabilities alone, but is captured by a set of probabilities, sets of probabilities organized by confidence levels. And this uh, explains both our, our disposition to learn from new evidence and provides a rationale for the kinds of decision making that Brian uh, was described to us. So I didn't really need to say very much more about this. 30 seconds if you're granted sure, to me. 30 seconds between friends. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, just to sort of coming through. So in this, so back to model uncertainty. Okay, so in this, when we're thinking now specifically about model uncertainty, uh, what this, once we understand that what we should be worried about when we're making decision making is not just the odds that we're being offered, uh, but also our exposure, um, then uh, we, can, we can see the utility of thinking in terms of this nested set of families where these nested sets here are being generated by our our confidence in the models that are generating the, the probabilities that, that we're interested in. So typically in these things we, we have some kind of reference model which we can put at the center of our nested set and then we can organize confidence levels around them. And if we have a well-behaved confidence relation over these judgments then it will induce a nested set of this kind. So we can be sure that something like this exists provided you know our confidence judgments are rational. Like, I mean, so that's of course where all the monkey business is hidden, but yeah. And then uh, 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 you plug that into Brian's scheme, right, uh, where you make, you basically, uh, the idea is that you have a division of labor now between the scientist and the policymaker. The scientist does the confidence grading of the models on the basis of the weight of evidence, broadly a la the IPCC. Um, and then the decision maker, t you know, is supplied with that, uh, confidence organized set of probabilities, decides what level of confidence they require for the decision at hand, picks that confidence level and then uses some decision rule that's sort of sensitive to the, to the interval that's been determined by that. And that gives, so you could use maximum EU, but you could use whatever the other things are. And that gives you, uh, you know, uh, both an operationable way of managing your model uncertainty and it gives you a way of managing it that I think is sensitive in an important way to the division of labor that does justice to sort of Tony's point about scientists being responsible to some extent. They ought to report everything that they know insofar as they, it, it's you know, up to the point where they think it's decision relevant. Uh, and what they know can be encoded in these confidence gradings even if it's not encoded in the models themselves. Um, but at the same time it doesn't lead to an interference with the, the, the role that values need to played here, which is determining your caution in respect to these things. Okay, so I'll leave it there. We have a few minutes before we'll break for coffee. Uh, I'm trying to think things through. Actually, since Brian's talk yesterday, I've been trying to think, uh, or whenever it was, uh, I've been trying to think through. Two days. Uh, two days ago. <laughs> yeah. How time I feel flies. like I've been here for <laughs> <laughs> uh, Think through <laughs> co confidence. Um, uh, so let me freeform a little bit. Um, the uh, in uh, there's a word that I use repeat, not just me, but that a, I and every economist I know who does empirical work uh, seems to use uh, once a, every a couple of minutes, which is uh, credibility. Yeah. And um, I, I've I, I I've been trying to think about the relationship between credibility and confidence and the the. I, you know, I did something myself 
I, where I, I, I invented something called the law of decreasing credibility, uh -huh. which was the more assumptions you make, the stronger they are, and that's better, but they're less credible. And so it was very, it was ordinal, yeah. just as uh, the confidence is uh, yeah. ordinal. Yeah. Um, and then I've pushed for scientific reporting, uh, making assumptions, you know, stronger assumptions and weaker assumptions, and yeah. reporting results under all of them. So that, which I think I could translate as reporting results under different confidence levels, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, so far, we're, uh, we're fine. Um, yeah. You just have a very particular way of assessing confidence, which is, I mean, you're not using the sort of weight of evidence idea, which, which sort of is fairly critical to the way I understand what generates confidence. But you're looking at something else. That well, I it's, it's, it's just basically, ne it's, it's, I, I mean, for me, it's mathematical. It's, it's nesting assumptions. Because you, you talk about model uncertainty, right? Mm. Is that you can make models with the weaker assumptions or stronger yeah. assumptions, and the one with stronger assumptions sure. are less credible than the ones yeah. with weaker assumptions. Mathematically. So, so there is a, a, a logical uh, nesting yeah. that goes on, so that, that feels uh, fine to me. Th but there are just a couple of points that um, have been bugging me. Uh, one, one of the smaller is, sem is about semantics. Um, and I mean, you, you talked about, you know, we want. This, you privilege intuition, and you so, said you know we have this intuitive view of confidence, since we make the theory bring that into account. Yeah. Take that into account. Well, yeah, of course it could be the other way. It could be our intuitions are off. Yep. And, what, and what, I was giving a seminar once and using the word credible about forty nine times in two minutes, mm -hmm. and someone raised their hand and said, "Can you define credible?" And I, I stood there, and I couldn't define credible. I know yeah. everybody knows what credible is. So after the seminar, I went to the Oxford English Dictionary online, and here's what I found, and I've, I've reported this in print, that the definition of uh, uh, credible was uh, being plausible. And then I went to plausible, and guess what? Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I found that plausible was defined by the OED as being credible. Yeah. And then I stopped. <laughs> and, uh, and then I uh, came to the conclusion that th this is a well-defined notion. I think humans, sh we, 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 but it, it's so inherently subjective that it, it becomes a primitive. Yeah. And I, about confidence, I, which I think is close to credible, but not maybe, I'm not sure, uh -huh. um, there's uh, the same issue. So, so that's a semantic point. The, the other point is in terms of the, what you and Brian are actually doing is I, whereas for scientific reporting, I push strongly in my own work, reporting things at different uh, credibility levels, mm -hmm. stronger assumptions, weaker assumptions. I don't have a sense of how to deal with it for decision making. And uh, so that goes back to Brian's talk about how you know how it should depend on the stakes or something. Yeah. That part I don't, I don't know. Cause well, maybe well, we haven't got how you actually do okay. that. Good, thanks. I mean, I think that's those are, you know, these are the sensitive points. So I'm going to raise them. So first thing about what you're calling semantic, I, I don't want to use the word credibility because it's too close in at least in philosophers' mind to probability. I mean, you say credibility, people will just think probability immediately, and. Uh, I, you know, these confidence measures may, in a formal sense, be probabilities when uh, you may, could model them that way, but that sort of would mistake this, lead to confusion of these two layer things. But uh, I think it is on the same territory, but the important question here are the determinants of confidence, and you're right. It's, uh, you know, all I've been offering you here is some very soft stuff. This, the, these points about looking at level of exposure is, was supposed to answer that question in a way that somebody who's sort of behaviorally minded might feel satisfied so we could tie what it is to have confidence to a certain kind of betting behavior if you, if you care about the behavioral stuff. Um, but I think one can also uh, do it in, in a principled way at the opposite end, end of the spectrum. You can sort of ask, you can start with, as it were, an abstract binary relation on judgments and you can say, I want this relation to capture s certain properties. Let me just write down what these properties are and see whether that constrains the notion of confidence enough to be interesting. And, and one can do that as well. I didn't do that here, but that's a, uh, these things, you can sort of triangulate from these different di directions. And I, I don't think uh, what you know, collectively people who are working on these things have do has done is, is yet enough to completely fix uh, the, the notion. But I think it's, it's, there's a lot of constraints there already. And the constraints are mainly through the form of in understanding what the effect of the, this confidence relation so characterized has on things like your willingness to sort of change your, your, your first order judgments in the face of evidence. 
and your willingness to switch between one policy and another when you learn something like that. So th that gives you a kind of what difference does it make type analysis of this confidence notion. And that, I think, is, takes us quite a long way away from just vague intuition at this point. But it's work in progress. I don't want to say anything. Um, uh, on the, yeah, and on the, exactly how do you get to the decisions thing. So uh, the, the here I just, I just sort of, you know, the, the way I see Brian's model, and I, I think it's nice, is that, I mean, you, you, uh, typically a policymaker will be, you know, not just thinking about a policy in isolation, but a, a range of possibilities. And some of, the, some of these possibilities uh, may be more sensitive you know, in this sort of robustness sense to, to uh, the kinds of models that they're using. It. And so that they can, here is where their own sense of, their own caution judgments have got to fix, uh, you know, the, the confidence level at some point. And so that's something that the decision maker has to supply. If they are able to supply it, then the decision making is sort of more or less automatic. That will fix the confidence level and that will determine the policy once you've got, you know, once you've decided to maximize your... Fixing one confidence level rather than... Their, their caution, so, so the, the, this caution mapping, as it were, that's in the, in the decision maker's mind, which is somehow comes from you know, what role they are, if, I mean, they're elected official, they must take into account the caution of their constituency and so on. That's got to map them from the problem that they face. Is this a problem of, you know, regulating traffic levels? Or is this a problem of building a nuclear power plant? Uh, given their, what, they, what level of exposure is implied by committing to a certain policy or to repetitions of a certain kind of policy, like in the, the betting cases, that should, will lead them to to adopt a caution level that's appropriate to the level of exposure that they're willing to accept. We need to sort of convert. Yeah, OK. There are several questions. Just a remark uh, about that. In, in fact, first level, probability. Second level, uh, confidence. Yeah. But there are also well, first are level. many levels. Yeah. So confidence and confidence and so on. Is that could be interesting to just look at. You can go as high as you think is useful. I mean, I just, at this moment, I mean, sort of for practical reasons, I don't think there's much more to be squeezed by going higher. I mean, I think though, sort of the, the three important levels, firstly, you can, you can be more or less precise at the sort of event description itself already before you even get to the probabilities. So you can, you can sort of gain confidence simply by being imprecise <laughs> right at the bottom. The possibility of the brain to, to go. There's also, indeed. Yeah. So this model is this sort of model is sort of slightly bounded. <laughs> Sorry, I have the conch. Um, it may be a bit tangential, but I think it's an interesting follow-up to Chuck's remark. Um, plausible and credible might seem to be synonyms, mm. but their opposites aren't. It seems to me. Implausible means I find it hard to believe. Mm. Incredible means I really couldn't believe. Yeah. And so when I'm or I believe the opposite or something. When I'm like. believing when I'm working with experts, I ask for a plausible range to start with. I, I used to ask for a credible range and then I found it hard to tell them what, what it meant to be outside that range. Yeah. And so I think it's kind of interesting that plausible and, and credible are not really quite synonymous. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And and but and, and, and both the ways that you were using that notion I think is different from the confidence idea. I mean th those are sort of families of notions around probability, but slightly yeah. Yeah. But so, so one of the reasons why I don't want to use either of those words is because they throw up all sorts of other things. I mean, not that confidence doesn't throw lots of things up, but it's sort of pick a word that doesn't mean anything like probability, at least not immediately. Yeah. So uh, let's thank Richard again.